Hi everyone, we're here from TEDx Singapore Studios, talking today to Don Ko, industrial designer, co-founder of the studio known as Stuck, and also a lecturer at NUS. Hi hey, Don. Hey, uh, good to be here. So, really good to have you here today. First of all, talk to me a little bit about how you think design is going to evolve in this pandemic, short term and then moving on to long term. That's a question that I get quite a lot, um, especially with this uh, pandemic period and everyone is asking for answers, right? Sometimes for capitalizing on the opportunity, right? sometimes for just uh, getting prepared. Um, well, I find that one of the most missing uh, gap that we don't uh, bring to mind when we ask about what will change is uh, what will stay, right. right? I think in the short term, a lot of things will change, right? Like we will change, uh, you know, we will erect barricades. We will kind of like uh, put on masks uh, as the easiest mask that we can get hold of. Uh, we will put stickers on the floor. Um, but after a little while, you know, the human uh, being uh, wants, to, wants to kind of like still have, you know, a certain sense of um, control over your environment, over right. your products, you know, instead of the products and environment controlling you. So we will, we will kind of push back against that somewhat. Right, once the survival question is, uh, is, is no longer top of mind. Right? So uh, I think a lot of things with regards to human beings liking to bond with each other, uh, human beings liking to feel like they're learning and growing, they like to feel things, sensations, emotions. I think these things will all stay. And, and in fact, we will find that perhaps barriers, masks, they will all start to soften. Right. They will start to become more like part of our environment, uh, more acceptable to brands, uh, more acceptable in homes. Yeah. And the, sh the shift. So, for example, you said, you know, we move to masks, we move to barriers. What, in your view, as in your observation of the last pretty much one year, has changed? What started out as being short term and then and has slowly started to evolve? The most uh, short term kind of uh, evolution of this is visible in the distancing markers that right. are placed. Right. Okay. We started off with like masking tape and then, you know, it's actually pretty cute to observe. Then different ones start to kind of put a cute polka dot instead of like a cross, right? Um, start to kind of put plants. So that almost uh, was what I explained, you know, that evolution, but compressed just because that medium is so quick to evolve. It's not like you have to invent something in order to kind of uh, activate uh, that into a more acceptable form. Right. So one of the interesting projects that you've done is something called the lift button project. And I think that that came out of the concept of people having to touch things, which of course became pretty much anathema in, during COVID. And you've done a fair amount of work on that. So can you tell us a little bit about what you did there? What inspired you to do the lift button project and what that's all about? Well, the lift button project started off almost like a response to COVID in the sense of um, let's not have it take so much from us. You know, as a designer, you know, we're saying that like, um, yes, it is a problem, but there's something that can be redeemed here, right? And, and one of the uh, things that we were challenging ourselves to think about was some, you know, when the moment you go into uh, don't touch things, um, it's very quick for us to do sensors and uh, distance sensing uh, devices that completely take away your sense of tactility, right? Um, so now, you know, lift buttons, it's, it's been happening, right? Uh, you put your hand near and then it buzzes and then you can kind of like activate the button. But there is something about human beings and needing to feel <laughs> the button move, right? That we, we thought was lost. I mean, this seems a bit myopic, almost like a designer talking about something that's not so important to people. But on many levels, I would say the reaction, or maybe a, a bit of a design overreaction, right? To say, hey, what if even at a distance, the button yields to our movement, right? without touching it. Um, would that make something interesting? Now, the, the lift button itself, uh, to me, to be very honest as a designer, is slightly superfluous as a solution, right? Because lift buttons uh, and pressing them are not such an important thing in our lives, <laughs> you know, uh, to kind of feel the tactility. But, but then it opens the question to say, could we do things with um, less uh, yielding to that pandemic? Uh, could we kind of like have some kind of uh, more delightful response. Now, a parallel example that may make more sense in this space is a project that I recently guided in NUS, um, where we had a bunch of students uh, rethink how do you do a hand sanitizer, especially if you do a hand sanitizer with uh, children 
And we've had them basically say, if the sanitizer was such a, a mundane action of pressing it, and if you look everywhere, they spill all over the ground, right? This bunch of uh, students, they uh, said, what if we brought more feel into these things? And they spent time trying to figure out how do you make sanitizer solutions bubble, right? And so what they created was like a bubble machine which releases the sanitizing liquid in, in happy form, right? So children, children went crazy when they tested it because you could just kind of like just put over and the bubbles came up. That may be less superfluous than, than a leaf button because in some, in some instances, I don't know whether in schools, perhaps if you want to cultivate a habit, right, of say, sanitize your hand, right, maybe it's, it's good to bring in some fun. So I'm going to challenge you on that one. That's an interesting point because right now everybody li lives in blocks or has to go up their offices or their homes. So I would have thought that the lift button project uh, is actually still quite important because that's going to be an enduring design, is it not? The COVID thing with sanitize, it might actually be short term or are you saying that both those things actually have an opportunity to just carry on in our lives and continue. One is more practical and just one is more fun. But fundamentally, you as a designer would look at this as something that, that mixes surely practicality with also an element of interest and fun, yes, I, uh, I, I would think. A uh, great question because uh, um, actually this brings to mind a different parameter that I use when I'm an analyzing why this is superfluous, right? Um, the, you know, in design, uh, we always trade off the resources that we apply to things and the effect that we get out of it. It's in, in the scarce resources that we face, we always have to make the best use of our materials and of course the time, energy, money, right? And to me, a leaf button, uh, analyzing it as a designer, having to have like 32 buttons or something like that, right. all move, right? It's a really costly type of uh, endeavor over uh -huh. here, right? So then when you measure that against what you gain, uh, it might not be that uh, worthwhile. So in your view, what you've just described to me suggests that there's an, an element also of needing to be able to scale, whereas maybe the lift button doesn't necessarily scale, whereas the hand sanitizer does. Is that right? Is it, so in industrial design thinking, that's where you need to go with this. Is it practical, but can we also roll it out? Partly, on a, on a partly way, but way also just being, being somewhat like a gatekeeper to decide, is this worthwhile to bring into existence in our world, right? You know, do we, does the world need this? Um, should we dedicate resource to do this or can it be used for something else? Yeah. Okay, let's move on to another project. Um, another one that you've been involved in is called the sliding door. Okay. Tell us a little bit about that. You see, the, the lift button project um, <laughs> opened up this paradigm for us right. of uh, things that move in sync with your body at a distance, right? And um, the sliding door, well, the lift button is a better carrier of the message at this point in time because people are sensitive to touching, you know, and that's where the public spaces are. The sliding door um, being a more efficient format because you only need one sensor and only one thing is moving, right? Instead of like 32 buttons would be, in my mind, a better place to use this um, concept of kinetic touchless. So, so I've been fortunate enough to be able to see the video, but describe to us what, what actually happens in the sliding door, because I think for the, you know, the, the, the audience today, they won't really know what that means with the hand. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Well, the whole, the, the whole kinetic touchless uh, type of concept was basically coming out from you feeling like you're Darth Vader, you know? <laughs> right. Right. And, and, yeah, with okay. the, the ability to kind of like lock onto something at a distance and then it follows you, even though you're not touching it. So the sliding door is just that. When you get close enough, right. it latches to your hand's position right. and you can just open as much as you want, release it, it goes back again. It's, a, it's for me very interesting because if we talk about malls um, which try to be eco-friendly, and they install the doors that keep closing and you have to tap the button to, to yeah. have it open. Sure. When you tap it, it opens fully, right? right. <laughs> and, and it just stays there for a while to let you go. But um, here, when you link it to your hand, you can just open as much as you need to go through and just walk through and it goes back. So, so that's, that's for me, has some gains with regards to the efficiency. But was that also inspired by COVID in as much as you don't have to touch? My understanding is that also in office or home industrial design, yes. there, was, there was an element of that thinking as well which was non-touch, is that right? Yeah, it certainly started from COVID. The whole lift uh, okay. button thing came from COVID, but it opened up this thinking, which then, you know, with doors, indeed, we could use it for COVID purposes. Um, at the same time, it could be for other, other things too. So do you think COVID has actually been inspirational for you and actually helped in improving many designs? It's actually worked, it's had a positive side effect. 
uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're cognizant of the suffering that it has inflicted on a lot of people. Right. Um, but from a design standpoint, uh, any kind of change, good change, bad change, is usually stimulating for us. So do you think it's enduring, what you do and what you design, the lift button, the sliding door, the various other projects that you've been involved in, is your, is your objective often also to make it enduring? Or that's why I asked the question around short-term versus long-term. Do you think about that a lot when you're designing something, is that you want it to be able to be useful, practical, but also endure long-term? I think uh, if we go back to the idea that we use our resources properly, um, we always have to ask the question that it endures. Right. Also, you just don't want to be many years down the road, your grandchildren asking you, why did you do that? You know? <laughs> yeah, that makes no sure. sense now. Uh, that, that, that's, I think, uh, something that yeah, we, we, we tend to look at okay. often. You've actually been credited with a number of award-winning designs. So, great, congratulations, it's really good. Um, what do you think is the one design that you're most proud of? Oh, I'm certainly most proud of uh, the arc touch mouse that the arc uh, touch mouse that I had some chance to work on, you know. Uh, Why? Yeah. What? It's, it's just significant for me because uh, it happened very early on in my career. Okay. Um, and to be able to uh, land a spark like that to then make a product that has now survived for more than ten years in so many iterations was for me very significant. Right. Um, I was really thankful that you know. At the time, I was working in San Francisco. In fact, I was only a trainee, right? With not a confirmed position on that job. Um, but when uh, Microsoft came and uh, tasked them with the challenge to do this, I guess for me, uh, that Singapore education, where we are a little bit, you know, broad based, especially in the earlier years of your schooling, got me to connect design and the problem at hand with a simple phenomenon of uh, thermostats. There's the bimetallic strip in there that bends with yep. temperature, right? So that clicked and I just thought we could make a bending mechanism from such principles. Uh, I made it, um, <laughs> I went to build it and I just it gave worked. it to the boss and I think they were a little bit stunned by how it worked um, and so that's where it began. Yeah, so for me it was like, yeah, it's a nice, it's just kind of a nice uh, little milestone for me. I'm picking up something else as well, is do you think that since you emphasized that you were quite young, you were a trainee, you know, you've come from a different kind of education system. Would you agree also maybe that it also helped you in your confidence because you clearly came up with a competent design and that often if you do something that is credited, that is appreciated, it gives you the confidence to be able to continue and gives you that ability to carry on thinking, oh, you know, what I've done is actually pretty good and it can actually engender further designs because you think you know, it, it, it wasn't a failure, yeah. put it that way. Yeah, I think so. I think that's actually, um, so to some extent, there's a lot of things that were outside of my own control, right, at the time, right? The, the, the fact that I had such an opportunity, right? right um, and, and one wonders, you know, whether others uh, would have the chance to experience such milestones that encourage them uh, and exactly. lead them on to next right. things. There must be so many things in terms of design, in terms of design thinking. There's the American school, the European school, you know, the Far Eastern school, the Japanese school. When you think of certain designs, what gives you that inspiration where you stop and you go, wow, you know, that is impressive? I think the one defining thing that I'm most inspired by usually is when somebody takes away something and it performs better than if okay. you try to add something. So the reductionist type reductionist. of approach. Um, the object that always comes to mind and I talk about quite a bit um, is the balance bike. Right, I'm not sure if you've... Uh, the balance bike. Balance bike, you know, like the children's bicycles okay. where, you know, there's no pedals, right? They, uh, and I've, I was just stunned seeing my kids um, take to it. And then all of them learn to ride a two-wheel bicycle faster than any other kids that I know of, right? In fact, they, they don't even have to be trained. So for me, that's a, a great example because, you know, you can say, let's teach a kid to learn a bike. Let's hold it. Let's add yep. wheels to it. Right, Outrageous, and someone yeah. just says, let's take away the pedal, right? And then the kid is now running on his legs, but the, when he gets a certain momentum, it balances by itself. The right. kid never ever kind of deals with, you know, things that support him. And my daughter, it was quite interesting, uh, this was at Decathlon, you know. Um, she was uh, there after having used the balance bike for like a few months on her own. Right? She, she was like, say, let me try the pedal bike, right? The two-wheel pedal bike, got 15 on it, minutes yeah. she got on it, she's riding around the shop herself. We, we didn't have to teach her how to ride the bike. So that was, for me, like a, a really brilliant type of uh, solution, which is 
align with the clever use of resources. In fact, it reduces the use of resources to solve the problem. The only question I might have, but that's for another day, is whether an adult who doesn't ride a bike could learn on it, if it's also the ability I think so. of children. You think so? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. In fact, actually, the balance bike has a long history. Uh, uh, <laughs> before they were able to make like a gear system and a chain system, mm -hmm. the bikes were like that. They were the replacement of horses. You know? Yes. Uh, this, yeah, really? It was just two-wheel vehicles. So somehow somebody, you know, at some point in time, decided this should be the way we, we train kids to ride bicycles <laughs> and made that into a small thing and it came back as a, a really popular new device. So do you apply that when you're in your designs is that you try and take out yes, as much as time. you possibly can? Um, okay. it's, a bit like a, uh, it's a bit like a mantra. We, we go through okay. all the process and we always ask ourselves, okay, now can we take off something? You know, can we do this with $5 instead of $50? Right? It's not that it's literally that reduction, but um, it causes us to just, oh, Maybe it's time to, to, to think of the other way around instead of, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the third theme then maybe, which is around design and people. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, my first question to you then, is creativity teachable? Totally teachable. Yeah. That's a firm totally. answer. <laughs> Tell us more in terms of what? Everybody has the ability to learn creativity, how so? Well, creativity fundamentally is about improving things, right? And I think okay. everyone, in big and small ways are improving things in their lives. It may not be a product, you know, it might be just how do I cook this better? How do I talk to my kid better? Right? How do I, you know, um, just place this object in my house in a better way that's more convenient? So we're constantly actually improving things, right? Uh, so I believe that to, to a good extent, or rather I, I firmly believe in uh, the fact that everyone needs to play a role in this space, right? Else, uh, what, how are we living with just a uh, going around and numb to the, the discontent mm -hmm. of things that we, f we feel, right? Um, so the challenge is this, the challenge is how do you cultivate a healthy discontent, right? A healthy so, discontent? Yes. Okay. I mean, tell us more. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for a contented outlook towards life, right? Ah, but, okay. But in terms of improving things, we need to cultivate... Challenging the status quo. Yeah, we need to cultivate a certain kind of healthy discontent so that we are able to see the gaps. And the moment that you can see the gap, you know, a human being is usually able to kind of say, oh, how do we kind of close that gap? Right. Most of the time, we are either conditioned to numb ourselves uh, from seeing that gap, or we, we need some frameworks to help ourselves to think that way. Um, but as, as a designer operating for you know, some years, we've trained ourselves on certain signals that we always use. Mm -hmm. um, so at any one time, we can always see an object and know how to improve it in some aspect for human beings. Now, I think a lot of people can do that for many things in even at work uh, or their home. Right. It generates for me actually another question though, which is, isn't what you're talking about also around attitude versus aptitude? I always found that somebody has to have a certain level of aptitude to be able to do something, which is why I asked you about being teachable, yeah. but also you've got to have the right attitude to be able to apply that. Would, would you agree or what yes, would your thoughts agree. be on that? Um, in fact, uh, you need both, and um, seeing, seeing in uh, education even, there, there will be uh, ones who have a lot of aptitude, mm. so a stronger inclination in this space, but you still kind of need to work it to unwrap that gift of the talent right. that you have. You know, it's, you know, it's somehow the way we are given gifts, it's not just like, oh, you're just brilliant right from the start. Right? Even if you have the inclinations too, you have to work at it. Yep. Now, then True. there are others who maybe have less uh, aptitude Right, naturally, they can gain a very good stretch, right, to uh, through just attitude. Um, but in the same spirit of utilizing resources for their maximum uh, potential, um, we see designers and students this way too. Meaning that let's put everyone in their best game space. You know, um, where their natural aptitudes are, let's maximize that, and they are also happier. <laughs> you know, doing that. But but this also engenders the next question of this is not necessarily age specific, right? I mean, you could also have someone who decides to want to go into industrial design at a later age yeah. and start to learn and suddenly they discover an unknown talent, right? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, even at NUS, uh, we, right. we've had very interesting candidates who've, who are like in their 40s and 50s who decide after years of successful career elsewhere, they say, I just want to learn design now, you know? And they come in and it's like, oh, you are maybe 20 years older than me as your teacher. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, well. but they surprise us and sometimes even more so because of the clarity that they come to this with. And students, you know, from say um, the younger age, they might come to say, oh, let me try out design. Mm -hmm. But this is someone who is like, I've done a lot. Now I want to look at design. So that, that clarity is quite, 
different. So what do you say to those people, again, we've talked about this before, about those people who are sitting on the fence, who are not quite sure about their design, and they're not sure whether they should push it or they should scrap it. What do you say to people like that? They might come, you might have students, for example, who come to you and say, eh, I've got something I'm not sure. What do you think? How do you either encourage them or do you often, are you able to be a bit more brutal and go, nah, that's not going to work? Or do you, let, do you let them figure it out for themselves? Uh, well, I tend to lean on a side where um, it's not, if it's not too catastrophic to fail, <laughs> sure. right, then try it because Right. Uh, you know, in almost a singlish way, we have a bit of a phrase that we use in our studio. It's always like if there's something a little bit more interesting, we would just say, don't try, don't know, you know. That's the, the kind of a mantra. mantra right. Yeah. Um, in one of the articles um, that has been cited, you talked about this concept of imagining better possibilities. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Imagining better possibilities? Yes. I think it's relating to things like the healthy discontent. Um, mm -hmm. but we can imagine better possibility in so many ways that uh, could be really frivolous. And so I would prefer if we imagine in certain kinds of boxes that are productive. For example, we know that human beings always want to gravitate towards bonding, right? For example, we know that and it's, it doesn't change, right? We, okay. we need to be social creatures. Yep. Of course, there has two sides to it. The, the, the bond dynamic has like the need to be together and also the need to be apart. So if we, are, if we always bring to uh, everything that we do, this question, right. for example, as a lens, I think we suddenly can realize that there are a lot of things that we can improve, right? Like how does a sitting layout like that between you and me or chairs um, create a better uh, conversational response, right? How, do, uh, you know, how does a backpack that you bring to school build friendships? Right. I think, no, yeah, true. they or maybe even help you to open conversations with another classmate, right? They, I mean, these are questions that we don't usually ask of uh, things that we work on, right? But when you say possibilities, yeah, this, this is where we, we start to ask these questions. And, but of course, we, we don't ask the frivolous ones. We try to ask those that the human being will resonate with. Don Ko, co-founder of Stuck, industrial designer, lecturer. It's been a pleasure. I've learned a lot. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very it's much. It's been great.